your head. Oh. If you can hear me, put your finger on your nose. You didn't say Simon Says. If you can hear me, clap two times. Can you tell I like to volunteer in children's ministry? And all of you all can too. <laughs> so glad you are here today. Make sure you got a bulletin at the door. If you didn't get a bulletin, just raise your hand and Brandon will bring you a bulletin if you need one. Inside the bulletin, we have all our upcoming events. We have a lot of things planned for the fall, so please take a look at that. If you have any questions, please let me know, or if you're interested in serving or volunteering, also please see me after service. So guess what? Guess what? What? This week we start Bible study on Wednesday night. The men will be meeting. They'll be studying U-turns by Tony Evans, and we've got a little preview for that. Take a look. He knows our propensity, and he has compassion when we come home. Come back home as quickly as possible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So whatever inheritance, whatever God still wants to do for you, to you, through you, in you, don't lose anymore. Jesus Christ broke the curse. So don't ever talk about you being cursed again if you know Jesus Christ. The curse, the consequence of the law is broken. The greatest miracle of all is when you dip yourself in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. So join Amen. Pastor Nate and the other guys in the fellowship hall on Wednesday at 6.30. And at the same time, Wednesday at 6.30, we have women's Bible study, and we have a bonus. Women also are meeting on Thursdays, if you can't meet on Wednesday. And we'll be studying the book of Romans by Courtney Doctor, unveiling God's, what is it? Mercies. Thank you. Take a look at this preview. My name is Courtney Doctor, and I would like to invite you to join me for In View of God's Mercies, a nine-session study on the book of Romans. And Romans is a magnificent letter full of, of rich theology and deep truths about God, but at its core, Romans is all about the gospel. Because Paul knew that the gospel doesn't just change our eternal future. The gospel changes our present realities. It changes the moments of your day. It gives us peace and joy and hope and, and access to God. All things have been broken by the fall. So where does the gospel of grace need to go? Into all things. You'll join me as we take a look at Paul's magnificent letter to the church in Rome and that you and I will see more of the gift of the glorious gospel of grace in the book of Romans. So ladies, join us Wednesday night at 6.30 or Thursday night here at CCF at 6.30 as we dig deeper in the book of Romans. You know, Bible study is just, it's not just going into the word. It's building relationships. It's growing deeper in the word, growing with each other, building connections. It's so important. So please join us on Wednesdays or Thursdays for Bible study. If you guys have any other questions about the things that we have planned, please see me or Pastor Nate after service. That'll be great. But what time is it? What are we supposed to be doing now? Worship. So let's all stand and worship.
results from our faith and it guides us to where you call us wherever that may be to go and your presence leads us into faithfulness
deeper than our faith. He's deeper than our feet could wander. Our faith will be made stronger in your presence. When we trust in Jesus to lead the way, he makes a way. That's what our faith accomplishes. Stop. 
Thank you that you make a way for us. Even when things seem impossible, you tell us that if we just have the faith of a mustard seed, we can accomplish great things, and we can do that through our faith in you. When our faith is pure and solely focused on you, we can move mountains. I ask that you be with us. Give us hearts to receive the message and ears to apply it into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. morning. You caught me slipping. (laughs) Stop recording, stop transcriptions. Just kidding. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Happy Labor Day weekend. We're, uh, hopefully we're not going to start this again with the crackling and all that good stuff. Um, I don't know where I'm supposed to put these mustard seeds. I don't know who, I don't know who put these up here. But uh, I like it. I appreciate that. Um, Welcome to Community Christian Fellowship. Um, I'm so glad that you guys have decided to join us. Um, We are celebrating Labor Day uh, this weekend. And I have a message that I have spent um, a little time just kind of researching and praying over and really just trying to dig into God's Word and try to figure out what God's Word has to say Um, as we're in this series of faith, love, and hope, and see how this is going to be applicable to us in, uh, for us today. And so I don't want to waste any more time. I want to go ahead and dig into God's Word. We have a, we have a a decent service today in terms of length. Um, I know we have communion and whatnot, and I don't want to get any more glares from Liz down in front. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, man, I, every week she's like, man, you know, I can wait to see her do this here. So why don't you bow your heads here? We'll go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, this day, this message that you've given us. Lord, it is, uh, it is your word that, uh, that we hold dearly in our hearts. And, and so, Lord, just give us opportunities to apply what we learn in this place. Let us be aware of these opportunities to, 
take what we've learned and to use it for the purposes of our growth. You see, we are in this this, uh, this movement towards being like you, and, and oftentimes we can miss those opportunities to apply the principles that we learn in this place. And so, Father, I thank you for the ability to open up the Scriptures and to make clear what they say because of your Spirit. But above all things, Lord, I thank you for your Son. I thank you for uh, sending him to die on the cross for me personally, and each person in here that has a, a, a relationship with you feels exactly the same way as I do, uh, that we are, are beyond blessed. And so we give you great thanks and praises for this day. We ask that we take this message, Lord, and write it on the tablets of our hearts uh, so that we may go out there and glorify your, your holy name. And I ask this in your son's name, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is his great concern. As the business of a soldier is to fight, so is the business of a Christian to be like Christ. Some words that were put together by Jonathan Edwards as we are to consider our walk with Jesus Christ, as we are to consider where we are in our Christian walk and as we are moving into this uh, likeness of Christ so I want to welcome you to Community Christian Fellowship again. We're so excited that you're joining us on this Labor Day weekend. And we're continuing in our study, uh, the study of faith as it relates to Paul's uh, uh, balance of faith, love, and hope in our Christian walk. And so today we're going to take a closer look at how we're going to take this faith that we've been given and how we might turn this into application, right? We are a church, especially I am a pastor and a preacher, who is all about the application. I've seen many messages preached over my time, and and one of the things that has driven me to the point where I am now, why I'm so big on application, is I usually, when I take in a message, I sit there and I hear it, I'm like, great, how do I apply that to my life? Where does that fit in my life? At, at what point do I, I absorb, I breathe in the scriptures, and what point do I exhale that out and put that into practice, right? So this is what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to take a look at, at how we might model what the Bible calls faith in action. So here are my first questions to get us going, get our juices flowing, get us, get us all ready to go here. Have you ever considered why you follow Christ? ever wonder what you're doing with your, with your faith? Where, where does faith fit in all of this? The title of this message is going to be From Faith to Faithfulness. We're going to be in the book of Luke. Okay, Luke is in the, in the New Testament. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Ver, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 to 10. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull out your Bibles. Okay, if you have your, uh, your apps or whatever out, go ahead and pull those out. If not, we got it on the screen. And in the text, we're going to have a chance to see where true forgiveness comes from and why that is so important. Next, we'll have time, spend a little bit of time of understanding how faith is measured. And then lastly, we're going to close down with our homiletical proposition. Just as a reminder, I know you get sick and tired of hearing me saying it. When you get your own church and you get a role like this, you can say whatever you want to say. So it's my turn. No, I'm just kidding. Our homiletical proposition, right, is what do I do with the text? How do I take this and apply this in my life? So as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of background. There is a, if there was ever a subject and purpose statement for the book of Luke, it's this. And if you are recording this, go back and listen. The, the, the book of Luke could be considered as this. It provides an orderly account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ for the Gentile readership. This is designed so that... Christ uh, may certify that, that he is the promised Messiah for Israel. He is indeed the Son of God who became the Son of Man in order to provide a way for the Gentiles to enter into the kingdom just like Israel. Now, I know that is a mouthful to try to take in, but when you have a chance, go back and listen to that. So what else do we know about the book? Well, we know that Luke was most likely a Gentile himself, right? Because Paul uh, differentiates him between uh, being a Jew in Colossians 4. If you go to Colossians chapter 4, uh, he does that. And we also know that Luke claimed to be this historian. Uh, We know that he was very, very meticulous in the information that he took in. Right? And this would make sense. If you're a person who is going to go ahead and, and include yourself based off what Christ said, and you're a Gentile, and, and you're understanding this, you would want to make sure the data that you're writing down, right, the information that you're recording, is accurate. Because remember, you're going to go against what Jewish tradition had said, or at least what they thought it said. 
So this is, this is Luke for us, and, and, and we know that Luke is part of the Synoptic Gospels, okay? So the Synoptic Gospels meaning that uh, along with Matthew and Mark, they record most of similar accounts in Jesus in a similar sequence or timeline, okay? So you got that? You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke are part of the Synoptic Gospels, meaning that they record what Jesus has done on a sequence, in a timeline. That's what they call the Synoptic Gospels. In addition, Luke uh, presents more of the facts about Jesus' earthly ministry, and he emphasizes uh, forgiveness and prayer. And he focuses on the importance of individual actions for repentance, and he often spoke of joy. And where we begin in our text today, are we ready, church? Is in this travel log. Right, this recording of, of 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 where Jesus was moving, this travel log of Jesus while he's on his way to Jerusalem, and Luke has already covered the purposes of the gospel. He's already recorded the births and the the maturations of John and Jesus, and he's helping us to better understand the preparation of Jesus's ministry in Capernaum and the surrounding area. So, in other words, what what he's doing, what what Luke is recording, Luke is recording from Capernaum and all of those areas that surround that. Okay, the travel log, right? As they were traveling to Jerusalem, he's recording what's going on. And now that we have an opportunity to see Jesus is teaching his followers uh, in view of Israel's rejection, okay, we saw that in chapter 9 in, in Luke. Let's get started. Main point one true forgiveness comes from faith in Christ. The Bible says Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. Verse 2 says, It would be better for them to be thrown into a sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, you must forgive them. Last week I made a statement that encapsulated uh, the vision statement of Community Christian Fellowship. For those of you that were here, I said that the church's vision statement, the church's aim is to love God and love others. I said that, that our vision statement provides us with almost this North Star when navigating the ministries here at CCF. And our vision statement helps us remind us why we do what we do at this church. And the vision statement, we feel, is what God, what really matters to God, that people matter to God. And our role, our privilege, right, uh, uh, is, is to help each person have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we do, when we're able to love God and love others, we not only live missionally, but we walk in step with the greatest commandment that Jesus ever gave, to love me and then to love others, In order to do this, it's not easy as a leader in the church. Some of us know firsthand how difficult it is to to love one another. Right Right in the middle of your junk and in the middle of your mess, it's tough to love people. People are tough to love. But what we're going to do today is in this first section of the text, Jesus is going to continue to prepare his disciples to eventually take over their own ministries. And as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he he wants to teach them something. And I want us to pay attention to this first section. It's part of a larger context. I want us to make sure that we understand this. This this area where we're jumping into, we're delving into on 17, chapter 17, was was is is him looking back at something that happened earlier. Okay, this is an argument or this is a conversation of something that happened in chapter 15, right? Remember, we're reading around the text. We don't just isolate our text. Remember that, church, right? When we want to understand this. And so in 15, the Pharisees are upset with Jesus. They're inviting him to eat with sinners, right? They gave him a bunch of grief, a bunch of problems when he was like, I'm going to invite people in. And they're telling him, look, man, you can't eat with these sinners. You need to be separate from these people. So look look with me in in chapter 17, verses 1. He said, Jesus said to them, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to those uh, to who they come through. Uh, Verse 2 says, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with the millstone tied around their neck that causes any one of these little ones to stumble. When we consider the three adversaries that we have to deal with, the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? All actively working, all actively in concert, working again to pull us away with our relationship with God, we better might understand Jesus' words, that, that there will be times in our lives, church, there will be situations in our lives, there will be things that will cause us to stumble. 
But the text says that woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better if they were thrown into a, a sea with the millstone tied around their neck that causes any one of these little ones to stumble. And I want us to understand something. that The Jews followed this idea that in order for you to be saved, how did it happen, right? In order for you to be, to be made right with God, you had to do it through works. Not only did they believe this, but this is what they were teaching. And that's what Jesus was saying. He was saying that this kind of teaching is dangerous. This kind of teaching is going, they might as well just be better off of just tying a millstone around their neck and taking a leap into the ocean, right? And he was saying that this is not something that is correct. This is not something that, 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 that what you should, you should follow. And, if, and, and this is, is what they were advocating for, that this is, this is not what they just believed, but the Gentiles, especially the Gentiles, they were excluding people from getting into the kingdom because of this works-based theology. And the Jews thought that salvation was only for them. And as such, they kept teaching others, especially these young believers, these young people in Christ, the ones that were impressionable, ones that didn't know any better, ones that were new to this idea and concept. This is what they were saying. They were saying that, watch this, that salvation is by works and not Jesus. That's what they said. That this kind of teaching was exactly what Jesus was warning the disciples about. That, that teaching others that salvation is works-based approach to becoming righteous before God was dangerous. In fact, Jesus says this, as I mentioned, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea and tie a millstone around their neck than to cause any one of these little ones to stumble. Folks, they're not talking about little children here. Let's just stop right there. Time out. This isn't little children. These aren't the wee little ones, right? These are people that, are, that don't know any better. Like I said, uh, these, these were, this was the first discipleship group that's moving in this travelogue with Jesus. And he's, he's telling them that, that these Pharisees that we met back in 15, they got it all wrong. This is not how you do this. This is not, this is not a works-based type thing. This is faith-based and faith primarily in me. That they're in the process of doing this. In other words, Jesus is calling these, these group, these guys back to Galilee. He's saying, listen, if you want to do this the right way before I go, fellas, that you're going to be fishers of men. You're going to be teaching these people. You're going to have your own ministry. And before I go, this is what you're going to be doing when I'm gone. You're going to teach these people this way. That it's not by works. It's by faith in me. And while on this discipleship travelogue, they encountered people. I want you to think about this concept right? This is, they're, they're, they're seeing people, right? You're a new uh, believer in Jesus, right? You're a disciple, and you're walking with Christ. What does that look like? I mean, don't think for a second that he didn't come into contact with people that disagreed with him. He came into p in contact with people that, that challenged him. He came into contact with, with, the, with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that, that, that opposed him. So they're literally watching this, this struggle that they have, witnessing the miracles, right? And, and, and listening to the parables uh, that, that Jesus is not only teaching about the kingdom, but what is he doing? He's showing them that the attitude that they must model when he's gone. That they too need to adopt this model of this faith-based attitude. You see, as leaders in ministries of the gospel, they were not only the responsible ones for setting the example, they were the ones who were called to be uh, Christ-like and then show others how to walk like Christ. Right? This, was a, this literally was a discipleship program on foot, step by step. They're in, they're in a perfect vantage point of seeing how people act, how Jesus responds, what they're to do, and then they'll be provided opportunities to do the same. Does that make sense? And I love what Jesus does next. Having, having addressed the sins of the Pharisees, right? He was telling them that, listen, the Pharisees got it all wrong. But just so happens, when you guys come into to this point where someone's going to sin against you, let's address that as well, too. So I love what Jesus does here uh, with the Pharisees, namely that their unbelief in who Jesus was, their lack of faith. Then he continues to teach them about sin that they would experience with their brothers and sisters. Knowing this group, he not only anticipates their question, he continues to teach them that the attitude, the attitude that they're to emulate. Look with me. He says, so watch yourselves. If your brother and sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back and says, I repent, I must, you must forgive them. Does that mean that you stop forgiving somebody seven, the eighth time when they come up to you? Is that what that means? 
No, of course not. That's just figurative, right? That just means that you're just, you're to do, and you'll see this in the scriptures too. There'll be other places where it's like, you know, how do I forgive 70 times 7? And then people do the math, and there are some people that are in here, are not going to name names. You do the calculations, and oh, you're on the 149th time. You got one more strike, and there goes your ninth life. Be careful, right? Like, that's not what he's saying, right? He's saying that every time that someone comes back, right, who has who's recognized that they are in sin, that they are in error, and they are asking for forgiveness, you forgive them. But there is a system in which you do this, and this is primarily based off of Matthew 18, where Matthew 18 talks about there's a way that you go about rebuking your brother for the purposes, hear me say this, of restoration. Of restoration. The idea and concept, Jesus wasn't, I'm going to destroy you and that's it. It's no. You're in error. Let's, let's, let's rebuke you. Let's have you repent. Let's see that evidence of your repentance. And then let's put you on, this, on the road to, to restoration. So he says, watch yourself. If your brother in sin sins against you, rebuke them. If they, if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, you must forgive them. In other words, let's just say that you're the one sinning and one of your brother, brothers and sisters sins against you. First, we must have personal concern, is what he's saying. Uh, that each other is, is to obey his warning. Take heed for yourself. You, you're your brother's keeper, right? Cain asked that question. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. Yes, our, our duty, our, one of our responsibility as Christians is to watch out for one another, okay, and to help one another out. Your, if your brother and sin, brother sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. There is a recipe that you're to follow. In other words, correct them, hear me say this very carefully, correct them in a, loving, a lovingly, privately, a private manner for the purposes of restoration. People don't want to be called out in the, in the middle of a crowd, okay? I have seen that go horribly wrong when someone is in error and then someone else calls them out in the middle of a crowded space that never goes. That is not how Jesus did things. Nor should it be the way that we handle our brothers and sisters in Christ. And our tendency, listen carefully, is to hold a grudge. And what do we do, right? Because some of us don't like correction. Let me just, let me just go ahead and just call that out right now. Some of y'all don't like correction. Okay, I don't like to be corrected, okay? And I certainly don't like this thing, all right? I don't like to be corrected. And some of you don't like to be corrected, right? When you're called out, when you do something, and we're like, hey, listen, that you're wrong. And so what do we do? We wind up, the people that, that don't understand how this process works, they wind up and they sin more. What do they do? They run, right, immediately holding a grudge. They run, and they immediately start to gossip. You start to gossip, and that's not what he's saying here. He's not saying that that is, the, that is the incorrect approach. We're to speak truth and love, right? If you're the one in the right and they're in the wrong, you are to do this with gentleness and respect. And our aim should never be embarrassed, church. Our aim is to speak truth and love as image bearers, as fellow image bearers of Christ. This means that our responsibility is to encourage that person to repent. Recognizing that they're in the wrong and encourage them to repent. What's my point? Folks, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were not the least bit interested in forgiveness and restoration. They were so hyper-focused on the law that they had forgotten. They hadn't even known what it meant to love God and love others. They had the love God part down, right? They were 100% that they were zealous for God. But to love someone else, they were, they were not able to do that. And remember, they they thought that in order for you to be right by God, that you had to rely on your works and not faith in Christ. And that is not what he was teaching. And we're forgiven because Christ forgave us. Mature Christians, like the ones the disciples were becoming, understood that true forgiveness always, hear me say this, always involves some kind of pain. True forgiveness always involves some, someone being hurt, and there's a price to pay for the healings of that wound. Just like with Jesus. For us to be healed, for us to be forgiven, Christ had to, had to go to the cross. He had to suffer for us. And just like us, we have to do this, or just like Christ, we have to do this for our fellow brothers and sisters. This is why faith, love, and hope are so closely related in the Christian walk. True forgiveness, hear me say this, comes from Christ because he forgave us first. And we should seek opportunities forgive, to forgive our brothers and sisters. And now that we've seen where true forgiveness comes from and why it's so important, let's take a look at how faith is measured. Main point two, faith, let me say this, 
is not quantitative but qualitative. Faith is not quantitative but qualitative. The Bible says in verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. When Kayla was about six years old, Kayla's our, our oldest daughter, uh, she spent time in a room counting her change. This was, this was her thing, right? Almost every Saturday, we'd awake to the sounds of her plunking in more change, right? Uh, and, and, and then you'd hear her, right? Our room was just down the street. We'd hear this, uh, we'd hear her counting 65, 66, 67. And, and, and Elise and I are listening to this, these coins just, you know, accumulate, right? You hear this clink, clink, clink. And, and, and to her, the higher the number, the more money that she had. And it wasn't until later, until we sat down and learned that, 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 that each coin that she was counting, right? I was teaching her this, had a numeric value to it. That, 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 that she had desired to, to uh, uh, you know, become wealthy, if you will, with, through these coins. Uh, and and, and she was, the more that she collected, the more wealthy that she was, right? And, and in our next section today, the disciples are going to learn a valuable lesson as it relates to the kind of faith that they'd received. They'd say this, pay attention to this. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Upon understanding this kind of faith that comes in our relationship with Jesus, the disciples asked for more. It's in their question. Give us more faith, Lord. We desire to have much more faith than you're willing to give us. You know, the kind of faith that's in our possessions, isn't it? Uh, Some of us think that the more that we acquire, the more prominent we are. That the more items that we possess, the more successful we are. The more coins in the jar, watch this, the more deeds that we have done, right? We're accumulating this. The more stuff that I'm involved in, the more righteous I become. The more works I'm doing, the closer to God I'll become. And when that happens, the more spiritual wealthy I'll become. Folks, God's not like that. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you've been saved by grace through faith, and you were saved by grace through faith, that's all the faith you're going to get. It's not like you're going to get more faith. That's all the faith that you need, and that's what Jesus was trying to tell them. That you don't need more faith. Your faith, there's nothing wrong with your faith. It's not the amount of faith, it's the quality of the faith that you received. And in an effort to understand this, this, uh, this faith being, you know, give us more faith, give us more faith, the disciples hadn't considered the kind of faith they'd received. In other words, it was that they didn't need more faith, right? They, 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 they could have been, uh, it could have been because of their view of like lack of faith, right? Like, so this could have been something where they had seen the, the Pharisees. Remember, guys, think about this. They're walking with Jesus. They're learning how to walk by faith. Literally, learning how to walk by faith. And they've seen this group of individuals, these Jewish leaders, struggle in their faith. And so they're wondering, maybe it's because of the lack of the faith of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that they displayed in Jesus. Maybe this is where they're getting this idea that, that maybe we need more faith. That's why they asked. And Jesus corrects them. It, it, that could be for that reason. But remember, these guys were still learning this. Jesus literally is discipling them on the way to Jerusalem. They're witnessing this happen right before their eyes. And for our daughter, oh my goodness, what made her wealthy in her eyes was the quantity of the currency, not the quality. When she, when she was asked, when I sat her down and said, honey, would you rather have a hundred pennies or a hundred dollar bill? What do you think her answer was? It was a hundred pennies. She chose quantity because she had not fully understood, watch this, the value that comes from a single hundred dollar bill. She had no idea. And so was true with these disciples. They didn't know the, the amount, the quality. They hadn't experienced the quality of that faith that had been given to them by grace from Jesus. They had no idea. How, and this is what, the, this, that's, this is what the, the Pharisees had lacked this entire time. So the answer wasn't give me more faith. Your faith was sufficient enough. It's activating that faith. It's relying on that faith. And that is activated when you lean into Jesus When you spend time trusting Jesus is when that faith is activated. It's not the amount. It's the kind of faith that you have and where that's placed. And I love Jesus' response. Watch this. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, as small as a mustard seed, you could say to that mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now, is this about a mulberry tree? 
If that's you, no, don't get, don't get diverted. Okay, don't, 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 squirrel, don't do that. Don't do that in the text. It's not about the tree. You're missing the point. That's not it. He, he's using this as just figurative language, just going, listen, if, you're, if your faith is even this small, it's the right kind of faith. It's the kind of faith that you need. In fact, church, it's going to be the faith disciples that you're going to need when I am out of here, when I leave, in order for you to be successful in preaching the gospel to others. All you need is this much faith. And church, I would say to you the very same thing. All you need is this much faith. It's where you put your faith. It's not the quality or quantity. It's the quantity of your faith that matters. And one observation of the text for your consideration. Our responsibility, as Jesus taught, as it relates to our relationship to Christ, is to have faith. Right? Jesus said that if you have faith, the kind of faith that comes from when we accept him as Lord and Savior, the kind of faith that relies on him, the kind of faith that comes before works, the kind of faith, even the smallest amount of kind of faith, uh, does miraculous acts is what he's saying. Not that it's going to move a tree. That's not the point. It's that if you believe in me, the Son of God, that I can do and I am who I say I am, that you can do amazing things. And that's that kind of faith, church that allows us to walk in faithfulness. You see, church, there's a danger that the 12 disciples might get carried away by their works. We can do the same thing in our walk, that they, they would ignore the, where, where, where their, their, their power came from, where it came in their faith. We do this all the time. I, I'm watching it. I'm watching it happen all the time with people that at some point we go, we don't really need faith. We don't say that audibly, but we say that in our actions. I'm good right now. I'm not in a valley right now. I'm at a peak. Okay, I'm going to go do it on my own. I'll do it on my own. And if something happens and it's like, oh, now I have faith again. Uh, am I alone? Hello? Uh, hola? Yeah. I'm the same way, right? Like when things are going great, it's, it's easy to have faith. But I'm telling you, this is, this is what he was telling him. He's like, you need to be careful to not rely on the works like the Pharisees were, Rely on me. Rely on the person and works of Jesus Christ. And if the faith is this small, you can move mountains. That's the kind of faith. Because it's the quality, not the quantity. You got it wrong, fellas. In other words, we're given this faith so that we might carry out what God has called us to do in faithfulness. I'll say it this way. Faith does not result in faithfulness. The faith that does not result in faithfulness will not accomplish God's works. Why? Because it relies on ourself. You see, how do you activate faith in your life? You activate faith by believing and trusting in God. You want to grow in your faith? Then don't miss the opportunities that present themselves. Don't miss those chances to apply faith in your life. Don't miss those chances when it presenting where things seem to be insurmountable in your life. Don't miss that opportunity to trust God in faith. So often what we do is we run to our friends and we run to our gossip group. We run to our gossip plans, right? We go to these people and we say, can you believe? Can you believe he said this? Can you believe that she said this? Why don't you go to God in faith? Lord, I'm having a problem with this. Will you take it away? Lord, will you remove this obstacle in my life? And if you won't remove it, then what do I need to learn from it? Rather than running to somebody and having these little chit-chat moments and all this nonsense, that's not going to do anything. We're relying on our own works is the problem. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, were doing just that. They had rejected Jesus. They refused to accept that he was the Messiah by, by confession. And what's worse, they were actively teaching people that salvation was not through faith, but by works. And that's why Jesus warned the disciples that it would be far better for them to tie a millstone around their neck and, be, and take a jump into the sea. And what's my point on this, folks? Faith, the fully reliant kind that's found in our relationship, our union, our submission to Christ... Is, is all we need to carry out our calling as Christians. That's all we need. That's how it is designed. When we recognize that we can't do it, we cannot live this Christian life out on our own. It was never meant to be that way. The sooner you realize that, the better you're going to be in your walk. 
It was never designed for you to live by yourself. It was never meant for you to live in isolation. It was meant for you to live with other brothers and sisters as you struggle, but through complete submission and complete reliance on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And when we open our Bibles, church, the question that should be staring back at us is, do we believe what the text says on who Jesus is? Do you believe it? Or is this just some game? Is it real to you? I don't know. That's the question that he's asking. That's the question he's asking then, and this is the question that he's asking us now. Do you believe that I can do these things? Do you believe that Jesus is who he claims to be? This is the question that has been proposed. In fact, belief in Jesus is all that we need to receive eternal life. It's not that we need more faith. If we, watch this, even have the small faith in who Jesus is, then we might have that right kind of faith. It's not the quantity, it's the quality found, don't miss this, in the person and works of Jesus Christ. Now that we've seen how faith is measured, let's close with our homiletical proposition. What do I do with this? How do I take this? How do I walk out of this place, right, in the workplace, near the water cooler, right at the dinner table? How do I make this applicable? Stop. I know it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Pray. Yeah, you guys need to pray for this thing here. Because if you turn your back, I'm about to kick it out the window. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, follow, okay, this is what you're to do. Follow the examples of faithfulness. The Bible says in verse 7, suppose one of you as a servant plowing or looking for some sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourselves ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Verse 9 says, will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Some of the best lessons, church, that I've ever learned have, have come by way of role-playing. You know, a scenario is presenting where, presented where you've been given an opportunity to stand in the shoes of the teacher. You know, all great teachers do this when they're trying to make a point. All great teachers understand your position, and then they, and then they craft this kind of this example so that we might better have an understanding. All great teachers have the ability to guide us from, from where we are to where we need to be. And Jesus, the greatest teacher of all, does just that. And in our closing section of the text today, Jesus is going to balance one lesson and another. In other words, he, we could isolate this text, right? My sister came to me this week and was like, I, I need a little help understanding this. How does this work? There's three messages kind of in here. And she's right. In her observation, I could, we could... Cut this up to three pieces, and this could be three messages, right? And you'd be like, are we going to do faith again? And I'd be like, yes, we're going to do faith again. Uh, yeah, you went to uh, But she was right, but this is the brilliance of a teacher. The brilliance of a teacher is to take what you have done here, take what, what you're learning in this moment, balance the two, and then go forward, right? It's, it's, I'm going to make this come alive to you, and that's what, they, that's what he does here. He says... He asks for his disciples to take the place of the master in their own lives and teaches them a lesson regarding faith. It, it, it's, it's good for you to have faith in the difficult and impossible, right? This is a good thing when it's impossible uh, and, 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 and difficult in your life, but when it's essential is what Jesus is saying. That we, it is essential that we have faith in our routine tasks, that the master has committed to us. The point is that the privileges, that when we receive privileges, they must be balanced with responsibilities. Jesus says this, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after his sheep. Okay, let's just start there. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? It was not unusual back in that day for most people to hire at least one servant. Everybody had one servant. Servanthood was, was one of those things back in, in, the, in the Bible days that was completely accepted, right? 
And, and, and as I observe this text, the person to whom Jesus is describing in this is like a jack of all trades, right? Like they do everything. He was responsible for farming. He was responsible for shepherding. He was responsible for cooking. And Jesus is describing in this section an unordinary day where the servant would take the place of the master at the dinner table. He's describing an unlikely situation, church, where his disciples, right, the masters of their homes, would be serving their servants. This is not normal. So he's saying to them, Jesus says, you know what, fellas, can you imagine what this would look like? I mean, this was utterly ridiculous on so many levels. This was, this was absurd to what he was saying. Who does this? No master serves their, their, their servants. Servants uh, enter into a contract to serve. That's, that's their function. There's a clear understanding upon which they've entered into this relationship. That someone's in charge and someone is not. That someone is the boss and someone is not. That, 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 that you work for me. I don't work for you. And Jesus presents something that's so preposterous. And he, he's like, can you imagine? He says, Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper and get yourself ready to wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? That's what Jesus is saying. He's turning the tables. They can't believe their ears. No, no one, no one can imagine such a thing. And now, watch this. This is why, listen, this is why I want you folks I want you to read your Bibles in their entirety. Don't just read a book. Don't just read a section. Read your whole Bibles. And it is for this reason. When you don't isolate the text, we're looking for clues, right? Remember, I'm going to take a step back. Well, I taught you how to read the Bible. At least I'm teaching you how to read it. You're looking for what? Before you, you have observation before interpretation, right? You need to observe what the text is saying. You're looking for, you can't do interpretation until you observe. And you have to do a lot of observation before you can even come up with an interpretation. So that requires you to read the whole Bible, right? So when observing around the text, Jesus is saying while looking for clues to help connect the dots to our next step so that interpretation then turns into application, right? That's what we're going after. Watch this. Jesus has already, listen to me, he's already discussed He's already described his relationship to his servants. He's already had this conversation. He's already promised to serve them. And I know this because it says in Luke chapter 12, and I know 12 comes before 17, because I have a degree. Luke 12, 35 to 38 says this, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they will immediately open the door for him. Watch this. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, here it is, he will dress himself to serve, will, uh, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. Jesus has already prepared this. He's already said he's going to serve them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even when he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. Jesus has already promised to serve them, just like he's telling in the story. And what we need to know is that Jesus served alongside of them as a servant, but he wasn't just a servant. He was a servant. He was master servant, right? We know this later on because later in the book, this is what they're, this is what they're fighting about. Like, they obviously haven't learned this later on. In Luke, in Luke 22, they're starting to fight. They, 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 they say this, that the, that the king of the Gentiles lorded over them, but those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are, not, well, you are not like this. Instead, the greatest of you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Verse 27 says, For, you, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? That was his whole point. He's, he's doing it from lesser to greater with his articulation of this. And my point is that the story that Jesus is, is, is telling emphasizes faithfulness. That there should be a faithfulness to duty. From faith to faithfulness. Let me say it differently. If a common servant is faithful to obey the orders of his master, who doesn't reward, who doesn't thank, Right? That's part of the contract. You hear what I'm saying? That's part, like, dude, I hired you. Do your job. Right? You, you may get a thank you. You may not get a thank you. But that's part of the agreement. That's your job. 
There's no, you don't get special trophies for this, right? How much more ought Christ's disciples obey their loving master who has promised to reward them greatly? And that's what Jesus was trying to teach. Verse 9 says, Will he thank his servant because of what he was told to do? You don't get a special reward. Uh, there, there, there are times that, that are changing people. The people need to be thanked. People need to be encouraged. People need to be comforted. And while all of this is great, it helps boost our drive, uh, it, it helps us carry us through the day. It helps us bring meaning to what we do. Folks, a faithful servant should not expect any special reward since they are simply doing what they're told. This is how we go from faith to faithfulness. In other words, this is what you're supposed to do because you receive that gift of grace in faith. You're to be faithful. You don't get any special treatment. But Jesus goes beyond that. He's promised to give us so much more. He says in verse 10, so, so also with you when you have done everything you were told to do should say we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. At first glance, I want to make sure we're clear with this and we'll close. The translation into English is a little bit harsh. Okay? Um, but what I submit to you for your consideration is done so as a way to guard your service. Okay, let me say that again. The translation is a little bit rough, okay? But there's a warning at the end of this. And this is what it says. I don't want us to get hung up on this term of, of unworthy. Far from it. A servant, hear me say this, a servant who is faithful is extremely profitable to the master. In other words, a servant has been given the duty, the responsibility, the honor to care for the master's fields. The servant has been afforded the opportunity to tend to the master's flocks. The servant has been given the tasks and entrusted to harvest the master's food. All, pay attention, of the master's resources and values have been turned over to the care of the servant. Do you realize that Jesus doesn't need any of us in order to get the message out if he didn't want to? We have been given this opportunity to preach the gospel. He has turned over an awful lot to us in order for us to do. It's absolutely incredible when you think about it. And a servant, <laughs> this is what I like about it, uh, it, it's just like with Pharaoh in Egypt when, 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 when Joseph's care, you know, when, when Pharaoh turned all of that over to, Egypt, or to, to Joseph in Egypt, right? He became what? The second most powerful person. It's just like that. And folks, we have a great responsibility uh, it, 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 that is given to a servant. We have a great responsibility to, to serve the master who doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us anything. It's part of our job. It is by grace that we've received these rewards. And, and where we'll close today is with this warning. Like I said, this was a warning that Jesus was teaching to his disciples while on the way to Jerusalem. That before he left, before he went on and is seated at the right hand of God the Father... He wanted to make sure that they understood. And here it is. There are two extremes to avoid in our Christian walk. One is merely doing our duty in a slavish way because we have to. Because we have to. And that's a poor attitude to have. The second one is doing our duty because we hope to gain rewards. That's works-based. We don't do that. The, the proper attitude is for us to serve that the, the way we move from faithful faith, faithfulness is by serving from the heart. John talks about this. Walking in our faith as Jesus did provides us the perfect example of how to walk by faith. Do not do this to receive, but to give. Do this not out of obligation, but for application. Do this from the heart as Jesus did, and you will move from faith to faithfulness. Because true forgiveness comes from faith in Christ. Faith is not quantitative, but qualitative. And what am I to do with all of this? Follow the examples of the faithfulness. You see, a true and faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is great concern. As a business of the soldier, it is to fight. So the business of a Christian is to be like Christ. I pray that this week, church, that you look for opportunities to be faithful. Where you activate your faith is right in the midst of those opportunities. Do you believe that this is all you need? Do you? Because I'm here to tell you that it is.
Father, I thank you for this time that we're able to get together. Thank you for this time to be able to go over your word. Lord, there are areas in our lives that you continue to refine. Our faith can be shaken in many, many ways um, at, at, any given, at any given point. And, and Lord, really, all that's needed is the faith that you have already given us, that we don't need any more. What you've given us is sufficient enough. I pray that in our circumstances and challenges that we walk through every week, that we're aware of those opportunities to grow in our faith. And it's not for our selfish purposes that you've allowed these things to happen. It's so that we can understand you a little bit more and to encourage others to walk by faith. One of the prayers that I have today, Father, for my brothers and sisters is that we not be that church that just hold on to this concept, but we give it away freely, that we walk in it faithfully, that we exude it every time we open our mouths and we proclaim your word. And so, Father, I lift up this message to you in this congregation, and it is in your son's name, the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Uh, Sweating. AC on here, man? So we're going to dismiss Rose, and we're going to have communion. One of the the wonderful things about communion is that every once in a while we get off track, get off the path, if you will. Um, I know myself has have done that before as well, right? Communion is one of the ordinances that is given to us in order to almost clear that slate, right? You just simply need to have your feet washed. And so one of the opportunities we have is to be able to to have you reflect on the areas, right, um, where you've fallen short, because we all have. And it provides an opportunity for restoration, for you to go before the Lord and ask the Lord to forgive you um, and ask to be cleansed. So... What this should be is a reminder of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We do this not only in baptism, that's why baptism is one of the ordinances as well. It's, it literally symbolizes Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So I'm going to have Sherry dismiss Rose. Um, go ahead and spend a little bit of time praying, and then we'll continue. There's a faith that stands defiant and sends Goliath to his knees. I've seen his praise unravel shackles right off my feet. And that's the And that's 
Jesus, I bow before you in humility and ask that you examine my heart today. I pray that you show me anything that's not pleasing to you and ask that you reveal any secret pride or any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that have hindered my relationship with you. You see, Lord, I know that I am your beloved child, having received you into my heart. And I've accepted your death as penalty for my sinfulness. The price you paid cover me for all time, and my desire is to live for you. <clears throat> and while my relationship is secure with you, Lord, I know that sin can break my fellowship at times with you. You see, I'm still human, and I often forget who I am and whose I am. And you want to convict me and correct me and not shame me. And you love me like a perfect parent. And I know that you'll never disown me or leave me. And I know for certain, Lord, that you love me no matter what. But I also know that sin hurts both my, my heart and yours. And having said that, Lord, I can, can't begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion. I can't begin to comprehend the pain that you took for me and the fact that you died for me personally. And I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave me life, but not just life, an abundant life, Lord and an eternal life forever. Lord, I want to recommit my life and my heart 
I want to recommit my thoughts and my everything to you. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you fill me today with your powerful spirit. I ask that you forgive me of my trespasses and renew our relationship as you promised. Lord, I ask that you take all of this away. Anything that has not been spoken in confession to you, Lord, I ask that you just get rid of it. And I ask this in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Bible says on the night that he was going to be betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the scriptures say that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of my new covenant in my blood, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, remembrance of me. Let's drink. Father, thank you for the opportunity to remember what you've done for us personally. I pray that this communion be a time of reflection and restoration. As we are not perfect, but we do know the one who is. And Lord, I just lift up this church, this congregation, its children. And I ask your blessing upon the day, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I think to close us out, we're going to have Joe come up and um, offer some reflection and a prayer. Hello, church. How (laughs) y'all? All right. Uh, There's so much in this that uh, um, I had been looking at the the scriptures that that Nate was preaching on this week. And and then he opened uh, so many more doors. and there's so many takeaways, but I think um, my biggest thing is, you know, Jesus was teaching the, the disciples the same way that he wants to teach us. And if we can mirror the love that he has for us and and just walk with that this week and take that in all the things that we're doing in the forgiveness in the in the just everything that we do if we're going to walk and if we're going to mirror him we're going to make a difference and i that's my prayer for this week lord god um thank you Thank you for giving us uh, a mirror to look into, to see what, uh, what you want us to do. And, and we, we all live a busy life, and I just slow down this week. And this is more of a thing to me. Lord, just help me to slow down a little bit just to be your mirror, Lord and walk in all the things that you want us to walk in and be that be that light into the world. And Lord, I just pray these prayers in Jesus' name, amen.